Hello, welcome back to my living room for another masterclass. I'm Raj K, and today I'm going to take you through product photography. In this video, I'm going to take it back to basics for product photography, because if you're a small business owner like myself and you make your own products, it's likely you're going to be photographing them more yourself now after the onset of COVID. If you're an experienced photographer, there's going to be some tips and tricks in here for you as well. I'm going to show you some basic techniques as well as some more advanced lighting techniques. My approach to product photography is very similar to my approach to food photography. So there's a lot of crossover. So if you'd like to learn how to photograph bottles like perfume bottles or alcohol bottles, the same things will apply to particularly shiny objects. Take a look at my food photography video here on the WEX channel, as I've already done it there. To start with, we'll be shooting some stuff with natural light. But later on in the video, I will be using flash. My personal preference for flash are these. This is the 600EX RT Mark II from Canon and this is the STE3RT. So this sits on top of the camera and triggers off my flash guns. The flash guns don't sit on top of the camera. When setting up my flash guns, I always set them to fully manual. That way I'm only working with a dimmer switch. I can just turn the flashes brighter or darker as I see fit. The reason I don't shoot in TTL or automatic is because I want creative control. If I'm working with multiple light sources, I might want one brighter than the other, and this gives me the finest amount of control for multiple light sources. It's also much easier to balance daylight and flash for me in manual. For more information about flash, I will be doing a comprehensive guide on flash in my next video. One thing that specifically applies to product photography more so than many others is color accuracy. So often you want absolutely accurate color reproduction of the products you're photographing so that your customers know exactly what it's gonna look like. Which is another reason I recommend the Canon flashes. They have very limited color variation between firing. With cheaper light sources, flashes, and continuous lighting, you can get some variations between color temperatures, which means your color accuracy is going to vary a little bit. As I want this video to be an introduction to product photography, I'm not going to go into color management in all that much detail. However, if it is of concern, I highly recommend the Color Checker Passport by X-Rite. What you do is you set up your lighting, take a picture of that, and run it through their software. It uses that image as a reference to create a profile, and you apply that to your images to get perfectly accurate results. It's worth also noting you should calibrate your monitor to get accurate results as well. For this, I also recommend the x rite color management tools. For this video, I'll be shooting on an EOS R. For this video, I will be mostly shooting on an EOS R, this little camera. Uh, I absolutely love this camera for so many reasons that I've gone over multiple times before. It makes for a brilliant studio setup and integrates fantastically wirelessly with my computer so that I can be viewing the images from my computer as I shoot them. The focusing accuracy is also superb, which for me is the most important thing. Generally, I'll also be using the 100mm 2.8 macro lens from Canon. In terms of camera settings as well, I will be shooting things in fully manual. That includes a manual white balance as well as exposure settings. It's really important to have your white balance set on a specific setting, because if you're taking multiple images of the same product and your white balance is an automatic, each image might change slightly in color temperature and you'll get really inconsistent results, meaning you'll have to edit each image individually, which will drastically increase the amount of time it takes to edit your images. So for this, you can set your white balance to one of the presets, or if your camera has it, you can set it to a Kelvin value. Try one, take a picture, and see what looks the best. If it's slightly wrong, it doesn't matter, as long as it's consistently wrong, because it's one adjustment when you bring it into Photoshop. I'm not gonna be doing the simple white backdrop type photography. There are already plenty of tutorials out there to get that sort of image, and it's not really the type of photography I would do. When photographing products, I try and approach it from the point of view of trying to tell that product story. I've talked a lot about visual storytelling in my other videos as well, and the same applies for product photography. It helps to shoot your product in an environment that complements it. Having textures, color themes, and other accessories to complement that product helps give the product more context and just looks much better. I'm gonna use this video as a bit of a challenge to create something interesting out of stuff I just have lying around the house. To start off, I'm gonna try photographing my headphones. I'm gonna do this in a couple of different ways to show you the difference. But firstly, I have to apologize when I shot this, it was the hottest day of the year so far, so my legs are out. So I had to get my hairy legs on camera.
I've gone for a blue on blue setup for this. So I've got a blue background and I've actually just used my filing cabinet um, as a background. It's a nice color blue and it suits these headphones perfectly, which is a blind bit of luck really, but it just shows that there's probably things around your house you could use as backgrounds for product photography. Because some products are quite small, you can get away with anything as a background. A key thing for product photography is having your camera set up on a solid base. So I've got mine on my uh, Manfrotto tripod, nice and trusty. I've got it really low because my product's really low. It just saves me picking up my full filing cabinet and putting it on a table. For the headphones, I've just hung them using fishing wire. Um, I've used a very thin fishing wire so it's less visible and is nice and easy to edit out um, in Photoshop afterwards. Fishing wire is a product photographer's best friend. It is so useful for hanging things in awkward positions and putting things in strange places. And for lighting in this one, all we've got is natural light. It's a really bright sunny day, it's incredibly hot. And I've just closed our white blinds. So the white blinds are acting as a lovely diffuser and creating this lovely soft light across um, the headphones. It's this soft light that creates a lovely gradation across the reflective parts of the headphones. And that's what makes these images stand out compared to if we just use a really harsh single light source. Currently using my 100 millimeter 2.8 macro. Brilliant lens for food photography, as I said in that video, but it's also great for product photography. I wanna be using a lens that's over 50 millimeters for a number of reasons. Firstly, it really reduces the distortion when using wide lenses, you get lots of distortion around the edges, so your product starts to look a bit warped. Obviously, we want the product to look as faithful to real life as possible, so having a longer lens takes away all of that distortion. And the other reason I'm using a macro lens is I can use one lens for my wide shots of the product and get in nice and tight and nice and close and get those detail shots of the textures and things. Macro lenses are also incredibly good quality, so you're maximizing the level of detail. Because all the light's coming from the right-hand side where we've got the windows, um, I'm gonna use a reflector to bounce on the light back there's a lot of light bouncing around this room as it is because it's a white room, um, but it'll just help give us a little bit more light in some of the darker areas if we put the reflector nice and close. Now that we've done a nice simple setup with just natural light and the headphones against a blue background, I've changed it up now. I've put a table standing on its end as a background, so that's a, a nice wooden texture behind. And it's sort of browns and yellows that will contrast nicely with the blue of the headphones. For this one, I'm gonna introduce some lighting. So I'm gonna use a couple of speed lights, um, probably in soft boxes. And this time I'm using the M6, the EOS M6. I'm shooting at F5 at the moment, but because these hang headphones are hanging off the string, they are rocking ever so slightly um, and that will create a bit of motion blur and then therefore a loss of detail. I did have left it hanging for quite a while but it is incredibly hot today so I have the window open and that's creating a bit of a breeze and slightly moving the headphones. Another way we can get around that is obviously using flash. We won't need to use a slow shutter speed because I don't need to use the ambient light so I can have a nice powerful flash, bring that shutter speed down to 200 of a second and it doesn't matter if it sways at all. Firstly though, I'm gonna set up some lighting and get this looking lovely. If you've seen my other videos, you've seen me using the softbox already, but this is uh, one of my favorites. It's great for a single speed light, um, and it's about as big as I would go for a single speed light. Um, and it's a sort of deep rice bowl softbox, it's called. The speed light just clamps in, so it just slots in there, and we just tighten up that bit. And I'm gonna change the speed light to group A. So I'm gonna shoot this with the light on the left-hand side of the headphones as I look at them. That way I can create some directional light, but I'm gonna try and avoid it hitting the backdrop too much. I want the backdrop to fall away and be a bit quite dark and moody. Um, and we're gonna create a little bit more atmosphere in this image. We can control the light a little bit more with something called a grid or sometimes known as an egg crate. Um, looks like that. So as you turn it, it blocks the light. That just focuses the light into a smaller area. So I think we'll use that for this. So you notice the, the white of the softbox disappears quite quickly there. So we're just reducing the angle of the light a lot. Something I need to be aware of while designing my lighting around a subject is inverse square law. Inverse square law determines the light fall off. So in this case, if I have the flash very close to the subject, um, 
which I do, which I did have. Um, what's going to happen is the first part of the headphones is going to be really bright, and then it's going to fall off very quickly. So the other other side will be quite dark. I don't want that. I want a little bit more even. I do want some directional light, but I don't want it to fall off quite so quickly and can create uh, a blown out highlight and a, and a sort of area of dark shadow that's a bit too dark. So relative to the subject, I'm moving the light a little bit further back. It's still very large compared to the subject, so it should wrap around um, the headphones quite a lot, um, which is what I'm after. I don't want it to be really hard, but by just being aware of that inverse square law thing, you can mitigate any problems with you know, blown out highlights and, and, and stuff like that. So just having it a little bit further back means that the fall off between the front of the headphones and the back of the headphones is quite minimal. After a bit of tweaking, I've managed to get the lighting how I want it. I've gone for a much more complex setup than I had initially anticipated, but it started to look really cool, so I just wanted to add a little bit more and add a little bit more, um, and I got a little bit carried away. We're now at a three light setup with a reflector, um, and the backdrop is perhaps a little bit brighter than I wanted, a little bit lumpier than I wanted, um, so I might swap that out in a minute. One large softbox, one small softbox, and a, a bare flash. Um, from behind. The bare flash is giving a bit of a fringe light and the two soft boxes are either side of the subject facing onto it uh, from my direction. I'm currently on the M6 as I said. Um, this little cable is running to a capture device so that I can record what's on my screen. So I'm going to be looking down at my laptop. I've actually decided to change the background back to the blue that we had originally with the, the just the daylight setup. Partly so that it's a fair test and partly just because I thought it looked so much better, really. Um, I think it suits it really nicely. I think the uh, wood texture really doesn't add anything um, significant other than distracting lines in the background. Again, it's one of those things that you think might be a good idea, give it a go, see what it looks like, and if it isn't, scrap it. Don't hold on to all of these things just because you thought it might be a great idea and you've worked for so long trying to create it in such heat. The lighting and everything else is pretty much the same. Um, all I've done is I've used a little flag on the bare flash to um, try and stop the light hitting the background because otherwise you're gonna get a little bit of a hot patch on the background which will look a bit strange, it looks a bit uneven. Um, I want the background to be pretty neutral. So this is the setup. I've got the large softbox and a speed light there. There's the headphones and a small softbox with another little speed light. And there is another little speed light hidden under the box. So that light source is covered in a cardboard box and it's purely there to reduce the light hitting the background. So I'm just using the cardboard as a flag. Flags don't have to be particularly fancy, you can just use cardboard. It's best not to use things with strong colors because it can leave a color cast as the light reflects off it, but I'm not too worried about that on this. So I'll show you what each light source is doing. I'm gonna turn each one off individually. Um, I can show you that on the screen, actually, on the camera. Um, we can go across to um, flash control, um, external flash function setting, and we can bring up this menu. There's a nifty way you can actually make that into a shortcut to a button that you don't use so that you can access the flash settings on the back screen much quicker. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly how to get to that. So. On this screen, I've got to that by pressing info. 
I go down to custom controls, customize buttons, and I'm going to set the exposure lock button. Um, I very rarely, well, I never use that button, so I'm going to change that to flash function settings. Particularly if you're shooting in manual, you're never going to use the exposure lock because it's locked to what you put it as. It's not doing any auto exposure, so I can get rid of that um, and make it something more useful. So now when I press that button, um, it just brings up the flash menu. So you can see I've got the A, B and C all turned on. Um, if I just turn this one off, um, and if I turn that one off, So, Group C is the little soft box on the right hand side, that's just, that's giving me some light coming from the right hand side, it's catching the logos and the, and the steel. Then I'm going to show you Group B is that one. So Group B is giving me a fringe light, so it's creating shadows on my side um, that create a bit more depth and texture. And then Group A, which is the main soft box. That's doing the bulk of the work, right? So if we look at that again, we've got a nice soft light coming that wraps around quite a lot of the subject. Hits the background a little bit as well, so it's illuminating both the, the subject and the background a bit, and it's creating that soft, beautiful light that we want. And you combine them all, so this is with the fringe light. Just compare the two. With the fringe light, without the fringe light, you see that separation that it creates between the background and the foreground it really makes the headphones stand out away from the backdrop. And then the last group, group C, um, that is adding some fill light to that front logo. See that front logo at the top of the um, steel part? That is much brighter and I'm going to make sure that the logo is more evident um, and also down the bottom on the cup there's a logo there which I really wanted to bring out and without that it sort of falls away. All right I think that's looking pretty good. So I'm just using a small aperture for this one I'm going to go with f9. I'm still going to lose a little bit of focus towards the back side of the headphones but to be honest I just think it looks quite nice so I'm going to leave it. For this setup I'm going to show you what I think is the most effective and simplest way to shoot product photography and that's the flat layer. I'm going to be shooting this which is an M50 so that's going to be my product for this one. The M50 is a small light and like fun camera right? Good for vloggers and bloggers so I'm going to shoot that on a really colourful setting. Flat layers are a really fun way to shoot product photography and they're really quite easy. And something that's really important for product photography is not just selling the product but selling the lifestyle around it. So I'm going to put in some other accessories and products that aren't going to be the main focus of the image but will complement that camera. My approach for flat layers is to accessorize the main product with things you think that person would also have. So if you imagine emptying the bag out of um, someone that owns that product, what else would they have? Now the other things shouldn't distract from the main product but it's nice to have a real picture of who that person might be. For example if you carved wooden spoons you might photograph that alongside um, some forage foods and some camping kit and other bits and bobs. For flat lays the surface you're using is really important. Textures work really nicely so concrete and wood textures that sort of thing look really good. Anything too busy can be a little bit too distracting from the rest of the image though so it's important to find a nice balance there. Another thing you can do is for bright colours, so I'm going to go for a really bright yellow um, background that I have. Um, I really love this with flat lays, I use this all the time. I've just rolled that out on the floor. The other thing to think about with flat lays is lighting. Again, you could do this just with natural light or you can do it outside in, in your garden or whatever. So I'm going to show you two ways. I'm going to do it with just natural light, with the light coming in through the window, as well as with flash. If you saw my food photography video, it's a very similar setup to the flat lays I did in that. 
but this time I'm going to go for really harsh directional light. I did that in the food photography video. It's exactly the same setup as I did in the food photography video, but it just proves how versatile a flat lay is for all kinds of photography. The last thing to really consider with a flat lay is your colour scheme. Flat lays really benefit from a well thought out colour scheme. You can go for complementary colours or really strong contrasting colours. It doesn't really matter, but as long as it's a very cohesive colour scheme, that's the most important thing. We're nearly set up, so I've put my um, laptop down on the background. Um, I've got the camera right in the middle, so that's going to be right front and centre. That's going to be the most obvious thing. Um, I'm using my headphones again, and I've got my glasses case, and the finishing touch will be to put these glasses in there, um, and a bottle. So they're all blue, blue and white items, they're all keeping within this colour scheme. One of the handiest tricks for flat lays um, is for round objects that you think are going to roll around a lot, put a little elastic band down um, and then put the bottle on that. Stops it rolling around, stays exactly where you put it. I can't tell you how many lenses rolled away before I figured that out. And then it's all about finding an interesting composition. I quite like going for geometric shapes, so I'll put things at 45 degree angles to each other and keep things along a bit of a grid. Sort of messy, I don't know, there's finding a balance there. If it's too messy it gets a bit busy. And then I'm going to add in a little bit of texture, so I'm going to, I've got these fake fern leaves um, and I'm going to just place them in the frame. I'm just going to use some spare cameras to hold props down in place because we've got a lot of them around. When thinking about your compositions for flat lays, think about whether you're going to need text. You can leave space around your main subject for text saying what the subject is, or if it's for an, if it's for an advertisement you can put stuff in. Because you're arranging the items the way you want, you can really think about the output so that you get your image exactly right for where it's going to go. I'm pretty much set up now, so I'll show you what it looks like with just natural light. The light's coming in and out of clouds, so it's changing quite a lot. It's fluctuating, going really bright and really dark. Um, which obviously if you're looking for consistent results and you're photographing multiple things can be quite problematic So I will then show you a couple of ways of how I would do this with flash. God I put my glasses on. I can't actually see if I'm in focus That's better the Thing I often forgot forget to talk about is camera settings. So I've got a 24 to 70 mil lens on there I'm actually shooting at 70 mil. So you want something that's over 50 millimeter in length the reason for this is because anything wider, you're going to get distortion. It's what I keep saying about product photography, food photography, and if accurate reproduction is what you're after, which you normally are with product photography, you're going to want something longer than 50 millimeters. 50 millimeters in some situations is fine. That's roughly what the eye sees. Um, but ideally, you want something a little bit longer. Everything I do is shot in manual, um, so I'm shooting at 100 ISO, and around f5.6, f8, something around that, depending on how high off the surface your product's going to go. That way we get the maximum amount of depth of field and everything is in focus. A shallow depth of field doesn't really often work very well for flat lays. I've got my camera set up on a boom above, that way I can set up my aperture to be quite small and have a relatively slow shutter speed without the risk of getting camera shake in. If you're hand holding, which is totally fine for flat lays, it's worth putting your ISO a little bit higher to make sure your shutter speed is fast enough that you can hand hold it without getting camera shake. This one is lit just with natural light, but it's worth bearing in mind that the natural light is coming from that direction, so it looks like it's falling down from above, if that makes sense. Even though everything's flat, I'm not uplighting the subject, so the, the camera's lit from the top of the camera down. There's a lot of light bouncing around, but if there is directional light and there is shadow, I still want it to be below the camera rather than sort of up lighting and getting a shadow above the camera. It's a small detail, but it helps it all look natural. Okay, so say we wanted this with flash and we wanted consistent results for multiple different products. We can't really rely on natural light for that. And today's a really good example. There's sun coming in and out of the clouds and it's getting brighter and darker. And my settings are changing constantly. 
So I've set the camera up to 200th of a second, f6.3, and I've taken a picture without any flash, and it's quite dark. The natural light is having a very minimal effect on the image. So little that the flash is going to massively overpower that. I'm going to use a single speed light and light everything nice and evenly and quite flat. To do that, I could stick it in a softbox, but it would have to be very large to cover this sort of area. The much easier way of doing it is to fire it at the ceiling. I've got a white ceiling, so the light is going to go up, bounce on that white ceiling, become a huge light source, and light everything nice and evenly down. It's a far simpler way of enlarging your light source. Because remember, the larger your light source, the softer the light. There we are, a nice simple way of getting even lighting across the whole flat lay with just one light. But if we wanted to make this a little bit more funky, we could add another light source. That light source, I'm gonna point directly at what we're shooting and it's gonna be completely bare, no softbox. I want a really hard light source because I wanna create hard shadow outlines around everything that's on the flat lay. For this second light source, I'm having it bare, I'm pointing it direct down at the subjects. Again, I'm going from a direction so that the shadow is below the main subject. How high you have that flash gun really depends on how long you want those shadows. But the really important thing is to have the flash quite far away. If you have it very close, the shadows are going to go off in slightly different directions because you're sort of going off in a wedge away from the flash gun. So if you have it much further away, that divergence is going to be a lot less. So it makes for a more realistic shadow. It makes it look more like it was the sun rather than um, a flash put very close. Then it's just getting a power balance between the two lights. If you have the light that's directly onto the subjects too bright and the one that's bouncing off the ceiling too dark, you'll get results that are way too shadowy. And likewise, if you have the flash that's bouncing off the ceiling too bright and the direct light too dark, you're not gonna get those shadows very pronounced. And these will look a little bit wishy-washy for lack of a better word. So I found the sweet spot tends to be to have the light that's bouncing off the ceiling about one stop brighter than the flash that's firing direct. There we have it. Really simple, easy to do, flat lays. There are so many variations on flat lays. There's really minimalist setups where you just have a couple of things and just some nice texture. There's um, sort of bag spill layouts where it looks like everything's fallen out of a bag but is very tactfully placed. Some of these work very nicely for, for one product in particular. Some of them work very nicely for a group of products. It's just about finding the, what works for the product that you're trying to photograph and what tells that product's story. So as I promised you, I am now going to show you something with less kit. What if you don't have the budget for all of that lighting? You can achieve amazing looks with just a single light source and make it look like multiple light sources using a little bit of digital trickery. It's not going to be really in depth in Photoshop, so you're not going to need to know loads about Photoshop to do this. All I'm going to do is take lots of pictures of the same subject with the light at different angles. And then we're going to combine all those images in Photoshop. To do this, I need to keep the camera perfectly stationary. So it's on a tripod, I've figured out my composition. Um, I've just gone for a really quick setup with some plants on a table and I'm gonna photograph this little lantern here. The lantern is the subject. I'm gonna put a, um, I'm gonna put a candle in there and light that. And then I'm gonna light the lantern in various different ways. You notice I've got a laptop behind me. I am shooting tethered. Shooting tethered really simplifies the process of shooting product photography. If the camera's gonna be stationary, you don't wanna be touching it at all. This way I can control the camera settings from the laptop and I can tell it to take a picture. I'm not gonna introduce vibrations to the camera, I'm not gonna introduce, and I'm not gonna accidentally knock it. The other advantage is I can see the details of the product that I'm shooting in, on a much bigger screen on my laptop rather than on the back screen of the camera. 
So all I'm going to use for my lighting on this one is this little cheap video light. You could just use a torch, you could use um, a very small video light, anything that's bright enough to affect this image even with a small aperture. I'm using a small aperture of around f8 specifically so the daylight isn't introduced into this image. You could do this in a dark room if you need the aperture to be a bit bigger. But as I've got sunlight coming through the window to, to demonstrate this, I have to use a small aperture. So I've got a really simple setup here. I'm not going crazy with the props or anything, but I've got this lantern and it's a little bit boho style. So I've put some plants behind. I've got a wood textured, um, well, I've got a wood table um, as my texture on the foreground. That's gonna be my scene. So I'll take a picture first without any other lighting. It's just a candle light. As you can see, it's quite dark, it's very dingy. Not really sure what the product is here, whether it's the lanterns or the candles itself, or it's just a generic image. Now I'll add in my light panel. My light panel has an advantage in that it's, um, you can adjust the color temperature on it. The reason that's beneficial here is I want to, I, I would rather like the light to um, match the candle light. Not completely, I don't want it to be the same color as the candle light, but if I put a daylight light source in here, it's going to look too white um, and it won't suit the image very well. So I've, got, so I've gone for quite a warm tone to the light, as you can probably see there. That way it won't be jarring and it'll look like there's other candles in the room lighting this subject. Now we just, now what we do is we just put that light source in the scene and we see how it's affecting the product and everything else that's in the image. What we want to do is take images with the light at as many angles as possible. So I'll have one from above, Um, let's say one from, it doesn't matter too much if we get the light source or other things in the image, because we're combining them we can, we can mask out bits where the light's creeping into the image. One from that side, you want to get ones from the front and from the back. And we also want to get some illuminating the background as well. Just a little bit, so perhaps from above. And, and also we want to get one just capturing the surface that the thing is on as well. So we want to make sure that that's illuminated in one of these pictures. There we are, so you see we're just light painting the subject here. And then we're going to combine the images of the lantern lit in different angles afterwards in Photoshop. Now I'm at my computer, I'll show you how to combine those light painted images of our lantern. So I'm here in Photo Mechanic, what I use to manage my images. Um, I've selected seven images with the light at different angles. I'll show you them. There we are. So I'm going to open them all up in Photoshop. Now we've opened the images up in Camera Raw. What's really important here is to make sure that whatever I do to one image applies to all of the images so that they're all consistent. I'm going to select them all and then open them up in Photoshop. Now that we have all of the images open in Photoshop, what we want to do is combine them all into one file so that each image is a different layer within one file. The quickest way to do this is to go to File, Scripts, and Load Files into Stack. Hit Add Open Files. And if your images were shot handheld and you're trying to get it pretty close, you can click this button here to attempt to automatically align source images. We shouldn't need to do that as I had it on a tripod, so I'm not going to bother. Now I have the file open with all the images as different layers. Then we can select all of the layers and use this little drop down menu which is our blending mode and we can find one that works. Usually Lighten is the best one for this. And you'll notice that the light panel comes into the image in one of the, Im uh, in one of the layers. If you know how to use layer masks I would mask that out. Another way of doing it is just using an eraser and deleting that part of the image. Like that. Now we have an image of the lantern as if it was lit with multiple light sources. But the really cool thing is we can change how much each, each um, layer affects the image. So for instance here, 
So for instance, if there's a layer like this where it's too bright, I can select that layer and reduce the opacity. And if in some images the light is hitting areas we don't like, we can just rub those areas out as well. And then we can just edit the image as we would normally. The next thing to do is to clean up your product. If there are any marks or um, if there's any undesirable marks, dents, scars, um, dust or whatever, it's important to remove all of this so the product is looking as best as it can. Then I add a little bit of colour grading and I'm quite happy with that. It makes a pretty simple image showing the land. For one of my side businesses, I make and sell bespoke furniture. So I couldn't pass up the opportunity to film some product photography for that as well. For these images, I only use natural light and I use a 24 to 70 mm 2.8 lens, the new RF one with image stabilization. It's absolutely superb and allowed me to get some of the wider shots if I was in a tight space. Where possible, I still use focal lengths over 50 mm but it just gave me that flexibility. And the key thing to photographing furniture is putting it in an environment with some accessories so that the viewer can get a sense of scale. It really helps people visualise it in their home if they can visualise how large it is. So for the TV cabinet, I put a TV on it as well as a PlayStation inside. Books, lamps, candles and plants make really great accessories and they just give your viewer a frame of reference. It's really important not to overclutter them though. and it is worth shooting some images without anything on as well. It might also be worth you experimenting with doing some short videos. While photographing this product, I shot a variety of clips, a maximum of 10 seconds long, and cut them together to create a small promo video. The likelihood is, if you own a camera made in the last decade, you have these video capabilities at your fingertips. It didn't cost me anything extra to do the video, but now I have an extra tool to sell my product. I edited the video in DaVinci Resolve, which is a free video editing piece of software. It's the same software I edit these videos in as well. All the clips were just handheld and a maximum of 10 seconds long, and I just edited them together in DaVinci Resolve.
Now I'm at my computer. Again, I've selected my images for the headphones shot. Um, and just to show you really quickly, and this is the image I've selected. This is the same image. Um, this is the image of the headphones with just natural light. So there's not a huge difference there. Um, but what we do see is more control over shadows and it's a little bit more dramatic. One thing I do immediately notice with these two images is the one that's just daylight has illuminated the background a lot more and as a result I can see I can see more of the marks and scratches on my filing cabinet as a result. All of my images go through a similar editing process. Sometimes I'm just colour correcting just to make sure that the colours are completely accurate or sometimes I'm colouring creatively to complement all the elements in the image. One thing I'm looking out for is making sure the logos are clearly visible and that there's no dust or markings on the product. I hope that's been helpful to you, particularly if you run your own business. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that was helpful. The next video will be a return to portraiture and I'll be doing a comprehensive guide to using flash in portraiture. I'll leave you with a slideshow of my finished images while I answer all your questions in live chat. Thank you so much for watching. Take care and goodbye.